Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Thank you, praise and worship. Thank you, my lovely wife. Um, you guys are awesome uh, in, in, in what you do and the service that you provide uh, for us. And thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, it's preaching time. It's the preaching hour. Um, we're going to um, indulge in a message uh, entitled, Lord, Help Me Adjust My Attitude. We're going to hang out in Numbers uh, chapter 10 and in chapter 11, a few verses from chapter 10, a few verses from chapter 11. Um, so um, come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we uh, are always in awe of you, God, and we lay before you, uh, Lord, uh, always seeking a word from you. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to hear. Please, Lord, your servants are listening. Fresh anointing, clarity of thought and clarity of speech, preaching power is what I ask for. In Christ Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. I once read of a dashing knight who longed to rescue his princess who was imprisoned by a cruel enemy in the palace tower. He devised a plan and, re and recruited two small friends to send her a message. Uh, first there was Claude Calip Caterpillar, who was a hardworking fellow but crusty and sour. He started inching his way up the wall uh, towards the distant window, but it was hard work. He grumbled that the sun was hot, causing him to sweat. Then the sun withdrew behind a cloud. It started to rain, uh, and he complained even louder about the raindrops. Finally, he heaved himself onto the window ledge, looked at the fair maiden, and said, Hey, you, come over here. You're kidding me, right? Claude gave her the once over and said, uh, you mean I climbed all the way up here for the likes of you? Well, the knight said, get ready uh, because tonight he's coming for you at 5 p.m. sharp. Think you can remember that or should I, should I repeat it? And he went off. Next, the knight sent Barney Butterfly. Barney too battled the rain and the contrary winds. He had almost made it to the window when a bird came and nearly ate him. But finally he fluttered in, landing softly on the lady's finger. Lovely favorite maiden, he said, the white knight loves you dearly, and tonight he's coming to rescue you. He asks only that you be ready at 5 p.m. The princess smiled and replied, thank you very much, Mr. Butterfly. You are very sweet, and I will be ready tonight when he comes. The caterpillar already brought me the message, but tell me, why was he so disagreeable? He brought me the same news, but after he left, I felt worse than before he came. The butterfly replied, oh, you mean Claude? Well, don't mind Claude. That's just the way he is. I used to be that way too, until I was transformed. Mm. <laughs> wow. Attitudes matter. Can you say that with me? Attitudes matter. As we are in this impromptu series on living a victorious life where the overall theme is sin can be mastered, uh, please note that the previous messages are on our St. John's Community Baptist Church YouTube uh, channel and Facebook group page by the same name uh, for you to view at your leisure. Um, one of the things that will keep you living a defeated Christian life uh, is the sin of a complaining spirit. Yes, mm. There is nothing more unattractive for a Christian than a grumbling, complaining, cantankerous, contrary attitude. Yes. Grumbling and complaining is a spirit of the world, and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in the world, but not of the world. We are the possessors of a different spirit. We are the possessors of the spirit of Christ and the mind of Christ. So here's the deal. God is concerned about your attitude much more than you possibly can imagine. It is not enough just to do the right things. 
And here's the big idea for today. God is not pleased when we do the right things with the wrong attitude. Right. Because your attitude reflects the way you look at life and the creator of life. Yeah. And the way you look at the creator of life will have an effect on the depth of relationship you have with said creator. Yes, your attitude is important and it is extremely important to the Lord. So let's strap in and see what the Lord has for us on today. Numbers uh, chapter 10, beginning at verse 11, reads this way. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the testimony. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time as the Lord's command through Moses. Jump down to verse 29. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. The ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them during those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. The children of Israel are approximately 14 months removed from the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. 14 months prior, they were slaves in Egypt, strangers, aliens, oppressed in a foreign land. God rescued them with a mighty right hand, spoke his law to them on Mount Sinai in their hearing, and now he is ready to fulfill the promise he made to Abraham to bring Abraham's descendants into a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> God is excited. Uh, the promise has been over 400 years in the making, and God is ready to make good on his word. God loves to make good on his promises. God is excited uh, to demonstrate to the world that he is, uh, and he alone is the true and living God by bringing his people from bondage through the wilderness and into the promised land. This is a major event in the history of the world. It took the Lord two months, two months to lead them from Egypt to Mount Sinai, two months. He led them through a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When the cloud lifted, they packed up and left. When the pillar of fire rested, they unpacked and settled. They followed this pattern for two months until they came to Sinai. Once they reached Mount Sinai, the cloud didn't move for 12 solid months. Hmm. For 12 solid months, for an entire year, the Lord through Moses gave the Israelites instructions on how an unholy people were to approach and relate to the most holy God and how they were to interact with one another. For 12 months, they were being instructed on promised land living. They have been slaves all of their lives. And now they have to learn how to be kingdom people, promised land people. Can you imagine the great excitement knowing that every generation before you hoped that it would be the generation to inherit the promised land? And you come to find out that you are, in fact, that generation that's going to inherit the promised land. Can you imagine the people getting restless with anticipation, knowing that any day the cloud would lift and they would continue their journey to the promised land? How in the world could they contain their emotion when they saw this stationary cloud that hadn't moved in 12 solid months finally rise to say, let's go and possess the land. Mm. God is excited. He's excited. It's been 40 years in the making. The people must be excited. Mm. 
And chapter 11, verse 1, reveals to us the depth of their excitement. Now the people complained <laughs> about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Tibera because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Hmm. The first attitude that would keep you from experiencing promised land living, experiencing all that God has for you, is an attitude of complaining. Wow. Complaining is wilderness attitude number one. Mm. And complaining is a sin. Yes. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Complaining is a sin. If it wasn't a sin, it wouldn't have bothered God so much, but it does. Mm. Let, let me give you two definitions by Pastor James McDonald uh, that uh, I think are insightful and useful for this message. Um, Pastor McDonald defines attitude as a pattern of thinking that has been learned over a long period of time. That definition makes an attitude neither positive nor negative. We all have attitudes because we all have certain ways or patterns we have learned to think about things. Uh, now, some of those patterns are productive and some are counterproductive. Uh, uh, some uh, are just uh, ways for us to think uh, and they may not push us in one way or another. Um, we are... Uh, we all have attitudes, and we should keep some of those attitudes, and some of those attitudes we should change. Um, the, the point we need to come to grips with about attitudes is that we all choose our attitudes. All right. We all choose them. God has given us free will and freedom to choose. Jesus Christ won that right for us on the cross. And just like you choose your outfit to wear in the morning, you choose what attitude that you're going to put on as well. well. Until you are willing to admit, willing to admit that you have the ability to choose your attitude towards any situation you, you encounter, um, then you, if you don't admit that, then the, for the rest of your days, you will continue to be frustrated emotionally in the wilderness, wandering around aimlessly, void of control. Mm. You choose your perspective, your response, and your attitude. You choose how you think and act concerning any situation. Now, tap yourself on the chest. Mm -hmm. uh, tell the truth and shame the devil. And say this, self, self. I, choose I choose my attitude. Come on, come on, tap yourself on the chest and say it like you mean it. Self, self. I, choose I choose my attitude. My Hmm. See, I know that's hard for some of us to say. I know it's hard for us to admit because we love to say, well, she made me mad or he made me angry or I wouldn't have done this or I wouldn't have done that if they didn't do this or they didn't do that. But no, no, no. You choose your attitude about a situation regardless of what was done to you or regardless of what was done in your presence. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes, yes, yes. Definition of two, number two, complaining. Complaining is when we express dissatisfaction with a circumstance that is not wrong and about which I'm doing nothing to correct. I, I'm going to say it again. Complaining is when we express dissatisfaction with a circumstance that is not wrong and about which I'm doing nothing to correct. First of all, you have every right to express dissatisfaction about something that is wrong. It is not a sin or complaining when you say to your husband, uh, I would like you to spend more time with the children. That's not, a, that's not complaining. Uh, th that's expressing a justified gripe. Complaining is when you grumble about things that are not wrong, but just different from your taste or preference or desire. 
Just because you would have made uh, the same, you would not have made the same choice or you wish things were different doesn't give you the right to complain about the choice that was made. All right. Secondly, complaining involves things that you are not doing anything about to correct. Mm. When you choose to whine about something rather than help resolve the situation or make it better or correct the mistake, then you are complaining. When you tell your husband that you would like him to spend more time with the children, that's not complaining. But when you get on the phone and you tell your girlfriend you want your husband to spend more time with the children, then that's complaining. Mm. Telling your girlfriend does nothing to help resolve the issue if you are not seeking godly advice or, or how to approach him or prayer to help prepare his heart for the conversation. Thirdly, complaining involves expressing dissatisfaction, which can come in three forms, verbal, behavioral, or mental. We express dissatisfaction with our words, our actions, and our thoughts. Can complaining in your mind, check this out, complaining in your mind is just as bad as complaining with words or actions. <laughs> with God, Grumbling in your head still counts. Still counts. Now here are four quick points about complaining from our lesson text. The first is this. Complaining is a choice. Complaining is a choice. The people chose to complain. Nobody made them complain. They chose to look at this situation from a negative perspective. And, and complain about it. They could have just as well been excited to be on the move. Uh, they could uh, have been excited about being out of Egypt, out of bondage, and finally free. They could have been excited about the fact that God miraculously cared for them an entire year by providing food when there was no food and water when there was no water. But they chose to complain. They chose to look at the glass as half empty rather than being half full. And when we complain, we hurt ourselves because we lock ourselves into a negative spirit. And we hurt others because we impart that negative spirit onto them. Listen, I refuse to hang out with complaining preachers. I do. You probably heard me say that before. I refuse to hang out with complaining preachers. Preachers, if I get the feel, if I find out and I get the sense that the preacher that I'm hanging out with is a complaining guy, that he's complaining about his congregation, complaining about his flock, he's just complaining all the time, I bounce. I bounce. I get out. I don't want that type of negative spirit to jump on me. I count it an honor and a privilege to, to serve God and to serve you, his people. Secondly, one of the most unproductive types of complaining is complaining about difficult situations. The word says that the people complain about their hardships. They didn't just randomly complain. They complained about their hardships. They complained about it being in the desert. They complained about what they had to eat. They complained about what they had to drink. They complained about how hot it was, how dry it was, wilderness living. They complained about the here and now without giving any consideration for their promising future that God was leading them to. They complained as if God was up to nothing rather than God being up to something. And listen, God is always up to something. Always. But yet they complained. They complained as if being in the hard wilderness was wrong. Hmm. Don't misunderstand me. Their conditions, I'm sure, were hard. And, and, and I'm sure during this pandemic, many of you have experienced hard conditions. But being in hard wilderness conditions is not wrong. It's just hard. Yeah, yeah. It's just hard. And I get it. Everybody wants to go straight from Egypt to the promised land. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody wants to have to deal with the wilderness experience in between. I get it. When you complain about the hard conditions of your present circumstances, what you are in essence is saying is that God has fallen asleep at the wheel. That God is delinquent in his promises. That God is clueless about what's best for you. Or that God is incompetent or insensitive. Complaining about your circumstances is a complaint against God and a lack of faith in God's ability to work all things for the good of them who love him, who are called according to his purpose. We love to quote that verse when somebody else is going through hardship, but we get quick selective amnesia when we're going through. Listen, God knows your pain. He knows it. God knows your pain better than you know your pain. God has allowed the hardships to enter your life. There's no doubt about that. But he's allowed them to do to enter your life, not to break you, but to make you. Yes, yes. Uh, God is for you and not against you. God loves you. He does not hate you. Uh, as Rick Warren states, uh, and I often quote this, uh, God is more concerned about your character than your comfort. Your character is best forged through moments of adversity. Th think about it for a minute. Just think about it for a minute. The people complain about their hardship even when they were on the move to the promised land. Mm -hmm. We complain about our adverse circumstances even though we know that trouble don't last always. Well, well. We know that victory is in Christ Jesus. We know that in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen. We complain even though we have so, so much to be thankful for. Yes. So, so yes. much to be so thankful much. for. Yes. As my daddy used to say, we just need to thank God sometimes that things are as well as they are. Amen. Amen. Because we all know that things could be a lot worse. Amen. Thirdly, the Lord hears every complaint we make. The word says that they complain about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. In the hearing of the Lord. The Lord hears every complaint spoken and unspoken. The Lord knows the motivation behind your actions and he knows your thoughts behind the actions. Some of us, we withdraw our involvement as a complaint. We say nothing directly to the people involved. We just stop showing up or stop paying tithes or stop doing what, what's expected of us. Sometimes we, we still show up, but we are there in body and not in spirit. We think we are demonstrating self-control because we stay silent. Uh, but there is never in time which you are actually and truly silent before the Lord. The Lord hears every complaint spoken or unspoken. Everyone. How could he not? He looks directly into your heart and he hears the complaint before it's formed on your lips. Yes. And he doesn't appreciate complaining, mm. which leads me to my final point. Complaining arouses the anger of the Lord. Complaining arouses the anger of the Lord. That's what the word says. The word says when the Lord heard them complaining, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Do you see how God chose to respond to their complaining? He sent fire. He sent fire. This was not boy camp, boy scout camp fire. Where you roast marshmallows and sing kumbaya. No. This was consuming fire that was aimed directly for the people. Yes. This was fire with the intent of dealing with the flaming of their complaining. And please understand this. God's fire is always hotter than your fire. Huh. Always. God. When you complain, you are flushing away the grace of God. When Paul complained about the thorn in his flesh, the Lord's response to him was, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Yes. 
When you choose to complain, you are inviting the Lord's discipline on your life. But when you choose to choose not to complain, when you choose to say uh, th that I'm going to rejoice always, and again I'm going to say rejoice, then you are walking in the Lord's grace and power. You are testifying to the goodness of the Lord. You are in essence saying, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Listen, in December 1941, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, one of the Americans who volunteered to serve his country was a man named Bob Feller. Bob Feller was a 23-year-old pitcher at that time for the Cleveland Indians, a phenom who had already pitched a no-hitter and won 107 games in the major leagues. Bob was reaching his peak years as an athlete, but he gave up three and a half years of playing to defend his country. When he returned to baseball after serving his country, Bob went on to throw three no-hitters, 12 one-hitters, and win 266 games. He was just the best pitcher of his time. But his years of military service, during which he, he, he could have won another 80 to 100 games, cost Bob much of the fame that he deserved. When baseball fans elected the All-Century team in 1999, Bob and his 266 victories were ignored in favor of two other pitchers. Some suggest that Bob Fella may be the most underrated baseball player of all time. Wow. Fella was once asked if he regretted his wartime service, if he regretted it. If he had any complaints, he said no. He said, I've made many mistakes in my lifetime, but serving my country was not one of them. We have all make many mistakes in our life. Don't make the mistake of harboring a complaining spirit, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Instead, have an attitude of gratitude that says like the psalmist, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Check out what it said. It said, the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth all times and continuously leaves no room for complaints. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word, God. And we thank you, Father, that like uh, you taught the people, the Israelites in the wilderness, how to relate to you, a holy God, a Lord, you're teaching us the same thing. And one of the things that your word has taught us, Lord, is that you do not appreciate a complaining spirit. You do not appreciate us, God, in our tongues complaining uh, that it actually points our fingers at you to say that you're delinquent in your promises. And that you've fallen short, God, in what you said that you would do for us. Nothing could be further from the truth. God, you are good all the time. Yes, Lord. And all the time, God, you are good. Lord, I pray for those of us who may have complaining spirits. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will take those and we'll lock them up and we'll throw away the key. And I pray, Father, that it will be replaced because once we take something away, it has to be replaced with something else. I pray that it will be replaced with a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of praise and worship, oh God, a spirit of jubilation, a spirit of excitement, God. Even in the most difficult moments, the verdict will always be the same, Lord, that you are a good God. Yeah. Help us to not see situations, God, for their worst, God. Help us to look at them for their best. Help us to understand, Lord, that you are always up to something, that you are always um, in our corner, that you will always have our best interests at heart, uh, Lord Jesus. Uh, help us to understand that with you, every promise is yes and amen. Lord, I bless your name today, and I thank you, God, for blessing our hearts. 
In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. 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 Maybe you didn't realize uh, that God is, has just been always good to you. Uh, maybe you didn't understand that. Uh, and and he wants to be uh, the Lord and the leader of your life on today. Uh, and, and so I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, for you to um, get into a relationship with Jesus. That's what I have. Christianity is not about a religion. Christianity is about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about relationship with him uh, such that uh, he calls you friend and, he, and he'll call me friend. And, and so um, all you have to do is bow your head and say something like this, uh, Lord Jesus, I heard what the pastor said and I do wanna be in relationship with you. And Father, I recognize that I, I got some things in my life that aren't quite right. Um, and I have some things in my life that, um, that need to be taken care of. Um, but you don't require me to do that, God, because you just want me to come as I am. And, and if you just come as you are, Jesus will wrap his arms around you. He'll love on you um, in a way that you've never been loved before. And he'll change your life and he'll make your life spanking brand new. Uh, and so um, you say something like that to the Lord, you express your heart's desire to him that way, you do it in a sincere manner. Um, he'll respond to you the way he responds to you. Uh, I pray that you do that uh, right now. I pray that you do that before the day is done. Uh, so we thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being attentive uh, to this uh, message. Uh, I pray that you'll take it to heart. Um, we got a lot of folks out there who complain. A lot of folks uh, who are suffering with a complaining spirit. Uh, release it today and replace it with an attitude of gratitude. Uh, so. Um, what a wonderful Sunday morning. What a wonderful worship experience. Good Good. Thank you. Thank you, honey. And you know what we're going to say to you? Uh, be safe, be, be well, well, and stay home as much as possible. God bless you. God bless you. There are several ways that we can give. You can give by texting SJCBC to 73256. You will receive a text message in return with a giving link. If you are a member of the Realm community, you can give through the Realm Connect app on your tablet, phone, or PC. Either text giving or app giving allows you to choose a one-time gift or scheduled recurring gifts. You may also give through your bank via bill pay or mail a check to St. John's Community Baptist Church, P.O. Box 2448, Newark, New Jersey, 07114.